So I've told a, a few of you guys, you know, that it's not this is not necessarily my favorite thing to do, and it's kind of funny that, that I'm still doing it. That's kind of funny. Um, but different things, like they, they put this mic in my, you know, I thought, okay, I'm used to the one on my shirt, and then they add the one in my face. And then it's, I'm not on camera, then it is on camera. So now today, um, I get Nehemiah 1.1, one, one, or Nehemiah 1, and I'm supposed to have two weeks with it. There's 11 verses, so guess what I get to do? I get to kind of introduce the book. Guess what? Never introduced a book before, so here we go. Um, so it's awesome. And the first thing we'll talk about is just the authorship of this book. Um, Nehemiah was probably written around 445 B.C. to 420 B.C., and if you look historically, um, both Jewish and Christian traditions tend to say that Ezra is the author of this book, not Nehemiah. This is in part due to some of the evidence indicating both books at one time were but one book, um, kind of like a first and second Ezra. Um, and it, it, Nehemiah could have been read as a sequel, frankly, to the book of, of Ezra. Um, there's some belief that the two books were divided into two um, in the third century AD which again lends itself to the historical thought that Ezra was the writer here. And then even the Greek Septuagint and the Latin Vulgate, they refer to the book of Nehemiah as second Ezra. Again, another indication. Also, Ezra is a scribe and Nehemiah a layman. Ezra would have had access to the royal archives, libraries, and, and such that, that um, Nehemiah may not have, a, have had access to in order to go through and read and to understand and then write about historical things that had happened. <clears throat> it's also possible, too, that, that Nehemiah kind of kept a journal, for lack of terms, and that some of the material that Ezra would have gotten, again, if he was the author, would have been um, from Nehemiah's diary, for lack of terms, or some of his writings, almost making it autobi autobiographical. Yet there are still some scholars that make argument for Nehemiah being the author. This is primarily with the language that's used because you'll see a lot of first person usage um, and we tend to make fun of first, term, first, uh, um, first person language and speech, but you can get away with it in a, in a book because it's basically you're telling about what you, what you did and what you saw. And then the last one talks about, and I don't necessarily subscribe to this, is that it was co-authored. Um, if, you, if you needed help writing, especially Nehemiah, it's only, you know, like 11, 12 chapters, something like that, there's not a whole, there's not a lot of need to, to break it up. Um, regardless, though, on authorship, because as we're aware, um, all scripture is inspired by who? God. Um, so we're left with a book about Nehemiah and how God used him as an instrument of his plan to return the Jews to the land of promise, the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem, and restoring a society after the laws of God. So kind of the when and where, if you will, the historical context. Um, so we open in 446 B.C., and it's the 20th year of the Persian king Artaxerxes in his reign. This would be modern, uh, modern day Iran, and it would be along the Persian Gulf. If you recall, Israel through disobedience was having to live in captivity in Babylon because in 606, Nebuchadnezzar came the first time, grabbed a bunch of people, headed back to Babylon, then he came again in 597, grabbed another group, took them back to Babylon, and then finally in 586 BC, came to Jerusalem again, took most of the people, leveled the city, pretty much decimated it, and took everybody back to, um, to Babylon. He took all the wealth, all the treasure, and the people, which are our treasure, and really the only thing that was left was the poor and maimed, because um, everything else was broken and just devastated. So we'll find that most of the book of Nehemiah um, tends to deal with events in Jerusalem, and Nehemiah as uh, kind of the main character, if you will, the, one of the leaders of, um, of the Jews, trying to take them back and restoring God's people to God's city and the capital of Judah. 
So, we have, so what we're finding here is about 70 years later, after the complete destruction uh, of Jerusalem, um, we find Nehemiah, and where is he? He's serving a pagan king. So soon, though, we'll see um, Nehemiah is going to uh, get a tour group, and they're going to go visit uh, Jerusalem, and they're going to they're going to try to restore it. Um, and again, this is 70 some odd years or 70ish years into uh, captivity. Uh, the narrative of the book of Nehemiah concludes in about 436 BC, and then this kind of coincides to the um, the dates of 445 BC and 420 BC as when the book was written. So it wasn't a long space in time between when the events uh, completed and when the book was written, which is good because people's minds are fresh and probably are able to to uh, give more detail. Kind of the main character again is, is Nehemiah, so we're going to talk about um, Nehemiah as far as who he is and maybe some of the reasons as to why Nehemiah. Um, we won't see anything else in the Bible really about Nehemiah, about his youth or his background. Uh, when we meet him for the first time here in, chap in chapter 1 of Nehemiah, um, he's an adult and again as we, we mentioned he's serving um, the Persian king in the royal court and he's the cupbearer to the king Artaxerxes. Uh, the first thought would be um, the position of a, of a cupbearer is of little import um, and really of, of no standing. Because really, what are, you, what are you being asked to do? Drink this. You didn't die. Good for you. Give it to the king. So how, how, how cool of a job is that? Reality, though, was as a cupbearer, it often had duties as the king's personal assistant, and often he would carry the king's signet ring. Um, People weren't trusted with the signet ring. You could scribble something down, stamp it with the signet ring, guess what? There's the king's words. Um, so they just wouldn't give it to anybody. So, so I think this, ultimately, I would look at it as maybe a menial job from a lot of people's perspective. Um, I would argue maybe that's not the case, and we'll see, because of his position in favor of being uh, the king's cupbearer, um, he would get. He would be allowed to take Israel back to Jerusalem. So I would say it's, it was a pretty important position. But regardless, one thing I think we could say is Nehemiah was trusted. You're not going to have a cupbearer that might slip the king a Mickey, right? You got to know that he's not because he loves the king, wants to do good things for the king, and doesn't mean any harm to the king. So Nehemiah was a layman. Um, he wasn't a priest uh, like Ezra, nor a prophet like Malachi. However, Norman Geisler noted that Nehemiah, and this kind of gets back to the, the idea that, that right time, right person, right place, you know, and, and learning important skills. Nehemiah's expertise in the king's court equipped him adequately for the political and physical reconstruction necessary for the remnant to survive. God had prepared him in what he had been doing all along. Um, if you're the cupbearer, you're probably there when you see negotiations, you get an understanding of how politics work. Um, so he got to see some of that firsthand, and I don't doubt that some of that skill set was what enabled him, right, with, with God allowing it, duh, um, allowing him to use those skills that he had learned um, as, he, as he went back to um, Jerusalem. So I would say he was uniquely prepared and placed in a perfect position at a perfect time to be used of God in restoring the people of God. Though he'd, and then he remained in Persia, and one would think, did he really care about the goings-on in Jerusalem? If he's staying here, maybe he had an opportunity to go. First thought is, probably wasn't the time, right? Because he was going to lead a charge, uh, he was going to lead the third charge back to Jerusalem. Um, but I would say he was, he was very interested in the affairs of Judah. As a matter of fact, there are some that would argue that uh, his brother Hanani, who had just come back in the beginning of chapter 1 to give him a report of the goings-on, some say that Nehemiah by, might have been one of the ones to kind of arrange that and get permission for that. Um, that's just historical 
thought. I hadn't seen anything to say, yes, this definitely occurred. But it's of interest. And I, I can see if I wanted something, I might would go tell somebody, hey, I want you to go look at this, this, and this, and this. You bring me back these things, not just you go and come back and you're going to give me whatever you want. I want to know what I need um, because I have a feeling that there was a stirring in Nehemiah's heart to go back, and he needed to know what was going on. Regardless, when his brother came back, um, he would have heard firsthand about all those things that were going on in Jerusalem and the destruction. And then ultimately, uh, we'll see the hand of God at work in Nehemiah by virtue of the permissions, protection, and provisions given him uh, by a secular government. God will give all of us um, uh, specific roles, specific talents, and he'll place us in specific places, strategic places, to do his work. So seeing Nehemiah serving the king as the cupbearer, good job, bad job, probably a deadly job, potentially, um, I, I still think it's important for us to see that, you know, that there is importance in, in all of the tasks, and we should walk in those things that God prescribed for us. Um, remembering this from Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So looking around the room, don't yell out loud, but, you know, what are your giftings? And then the next question is, are you using them? Um, and if not, why? God gave them to you for a reason. Um, you know, I'm looking here at Bruce. I mean, I have, you know, I have some relationship with him, and he's a photographer. He could just say, eh, I'm only going to do photography for cash. It's my job. Okay, well, that's great. God probably gave him that ability to take pictures for cash. But you also, we also see him, baptism, he's taking pictures. You know, I walk around when, when there's different things, he's taking pictures. God's given him a, a, a unique ability, and he's using it, right? All of us can, can, on some level, do some sweat equity. So when there's things to be done, are we doing them? Right? Or are we saying, nah, I don't have time for it, right? Just, just your time, right? We all have the ability of time. Um, what are you doing with your time? I think I'm going to watch television one hour, two hour, three hour, four hour. Next thing you know, I've watched six ball games and the day's done, and now what am I doing, right? Because God's given us all a certain amount of time. I mean, I'm not saying that's a, a talent, but that's something that we have. We all have 24 hours in a day, so what are we going to do with, with those? Budget, budget your time wisely. <clears throat> and kind of in that regard, um, you just can't walk around with blinders on your face saying, well, you know, I'm, you know I guess I'll be used at some point. And we'll see what happens. Um, it's not typically the way it works. You've got to be actively, actively seeking and watching and on the ready to undertake the specific tasks that God has envisioned and created for us. Because again, going back to Ephesians 2.10, he's created things for us to do. And then on the name Nehemiah, what does it mean? It means Jehovah comforts. We'll see throughout the, the book of Nehemiah that God through Nehemiah would comfort his people, returning them to the comforts of home. Nehemiah here is kind of a picture of Christ, um, too, where he gave up a high position um, because he wanted to identify, he wanted to comfort, and he wanted to restore uh, all the people to a right relationship with God and ultimately take them to their homeland. Similarly, as we know, Jesus left a pretty high position. Yeah, he was in heaven um, because he wanted to do the exact same thing, right? He wanted us to have a relationship uh, with God the Father through himself. Um, the difference between what Nehemiah offered and what Jesus offered is obvious, you know, um, Jesus can offer us offered comfort, comfort of heaven, you know, if we uh, believe he, he died for us and, and rose for us and we're a sinner and he's paid for our sins. Nehemiah couldn't do that, obviously, but, but again, it's kind of a foreshadowing or similarities between the two characters, for lack of terms. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19, <clears throat> starting in verse 18. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. 
That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the word, world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed us to reconciliation. Verse 20 goes on to talk about all of us being ambassadors for Christ and God pleading through each of us. So again, a question. Are you being, in, are you being an ambassador? And it's not just an ambassador here at church. I can be a I can't be an ambassador to my brother here. He already knows Jesus. So I can, you know, maybe encourage him or whatever. But then he knows Jesus, so am I really offering him thing? I think this goes deeper, right? In the marketplace, in the workplace, when we're walking around and here to some level when people are coming in and they don't know know Jesus, we need to be on the ready to turn them to Jesus and be an ambassador for Christ that way. Nehemiah was a man of prayer. We cannot get out of the chapter, the first chapter, before we see Nehemiah on his knees before God. You see Nehemiah starting in verse 4 of chapter 1, going up until the end. He is weeping, fasting, and praying. His passionate prayer for God's people would foreshadow those of Jesus in John 17, as a for instance. In In John 17, Jesus prays for himself, wanting to glorify the Father, He then turns his prayers to the disciples and the believers. So Nehemiah, like Jesus, had a burning love for God's people, and they both demonstrated a dependence on God through prayer. So when I finished this today, and I was kind of going by, if you look at my notes, a lot of stuff is typed, and then I wrote some things here, because as I was reading this, finally, I asked myself this, and I'll ask you this. Do you love God's people? More important, how about those that may not yet be God's people? Right? We need to love them. We need to eat with them. We need to talk with them. We need to encourage them. Why? This gets back to what we had said earlier. We're ambassadors. If we only love God's people, it's a great thing. It doesn't really help those that need to be helped the most. So... Um, I was kind of struck by that. I mean, um, and it doesn't necessarily mean, right, you run up to somebody and it's like, hey, I love you kind of thing. It's just what's your interactions with them? You know, you're at work and somebody just, just snaps at you and you know they're an unbeliever. Do you snap back? And you're like, Lord, they're having a bad day. It's all right. I'm going to be their friend anyway. And maybe six months down the road, They'll come back and say, you know what? I've snapped at you a lot. You're different. What's up? Guess what? Let me tell you. That's when you can actually share the love of God, your love with them, you know, um, and and the love of Jesus. And Nehemiah, as I said, Nehemiah had, you know, if you read through this, he had art for his people. Um, I think later in here in my my notes for the actual chapter one for next week, <laughs> Nehemiah did some crazy things to try and get the people's attention. One of the things was pulling hair. I don't know that that works in today's society, but it says he pulled people's hair. So I guess he'll do whatever it takes. So now kind of the story, if you will, of, of, of Nehemiah. Um, the city of Jerusalem was to kind of represent and glorify the Lord of the Jews. Um, it was kind of be an example. Those people were kind of to be an example of what a society, what people uh, who followed God and God's laws were like, sadly, um, like me, like perhaps many of us, it's, you know, you're on, you're you're in step, you're in step, you're in step, and then you're out of step. So um, the out of step part, um, we'll kind of see God's, God's going to correct them in order to get them back in line. So if you look at the city, you know, how did it glorify him to have an uninhabited, dilapidated city and its people, God's people, in captivity? It didn't. But because of sin, disobedience, idolatry, the Lord allowed the Jews to go into captivity as God had warned generations earlier through Moses. He was given them a a time of correction. Ezra kind of started the process of, of... restoration. Um, as we've been studying in Ezra, he went back a couple times and was working on the temple. 
Um, so Ezra was setting the stage, stage spiritually in relationship to God by seeing to the rebuilding of the temple. And then together in Nehemiah, you will see both of them leading a spiritual revival of the people, and they would direct both political and religious restoration of the Jews in their homeland <coughs> after the Babylonian captivity. Nehemiah 8 um, kind of gets into this a little bit, but specifically I, I was looking at and I read verse 9 to kind of get an understanding of, of who he was, who he was working with, and kind of what he was doing. Verse 9 says, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. So just before this, they were being, re they were being reminded of the promises and the curses of Moses and all that they had done, and they were weeping now, realizing we blew it, which is a good thing. But then the next good thing is you don't have to weep forever, guys. It's okay. God's going to forgive you, and we can move along. What's interesting, too, here is, is you know, we see, we see this may be later in my notes, too. We see um, Nehemiah here as a governor. You know, there's a lot of people that are like, Christians shouldn't be in politics. It's not a good place, blah, 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 blah. I would disagree. I don't know that that needs to be our ultimate focus. Our focus is on God, and if God tells us to get in politics, get in politics and, and make a difference. Um, but it's not the be-all, end-all. Um, but obviously, God's putting his, one of his people... In, in a political, in, with, in, with a, putting a political hat on him. So I think that, that he's okay with us working in politics. It's important um, because the, in, in, in the, um, the teachings here and getting back to the law, it's important because the spiritual foundation of individuals affects the social structure of any community. Um, I don't know if I want to go as so far as to say your community and your culture is only as strong as its weakest link, because I don't know that one person destroys everything like that, but I will say you add numbers to people that just don't care, um, that have a different way of doing things that aren't biblical, that community is not going to thrive in a way that it can thrive. So again, here's another note that I kind of, when I was going through to myself, how is my foundation? How is your foundation? You can only, you need to fix yourself first. And obviously when I say fix yourself, fix yourself in relationship to God. You can't fix you. God fixes you. Um, but how's your foundation? Because once you're good, then you can go help other people with their issues. Then you can go show them Jesus' love and, and be the um, ambassador that we had talked about earlier. So then, because the relationship with God was restored, the nation could be rebuilt and the people could, re could return home. But we'll see in Nehemiah as they return home after this long captivity, they found the city of Jerusalem completely in ruins. The walls were gone, the city a pile of rubble, and this would leave the Israelites vulnerable to attacks by any of their enemies. Um, and enemies weren't just people, right? weather ain't so hot you know it's 120 degrees outside that isn't good if it rains and you're being rained on and you're wet for you know three days that's not good <clears throat> so the question to ask then is how can you have a society in a city where few people lived where there were no walls no gates for protection the walls and gates like the laws of God are for our, our protection they are not there to keep us from fun. They're to keep bad things from happening. They're to keep bad things out. Um, two of the things that came to my brain as I was doing this was sex and drinking. You know, um, sex is great. When you're married, any other time, it's not going to work out well for you for a variety of reasons. You know, we look in the Word, and it says, doesn't say don't drink. It says don't be drunk. Now, I would not encourage people to drink because it can be a slippery slope. 
you know, if others see you, not that we need to just, oh, if anybody sees me do anything, because that could just cripple you completely. So you have to let the Lord lead you. But again, you know, um, if you don't take your first drink, you'll never become a drunkard. That's, you know, that's why the Lord says, you know, that's why we pay attention to that. Um, you can fill in the blank with anything, right, that you can think of, of there that, you know, the world says, this is great stuff, this is good stuff, and you can look at Scripture, and Scripture says, no, it's not, at least not in that context. It's not to ruin your life. It's to make your life better. Um, things you do uh, outside of the Word, outside of His will, law, prescription, whatever you want to call it, it's just going to leave, it's going to give you scars, it's going to give you baggage, Yes, you can leave it at the cross, and God may do such a work in you that just you never feel that you did a bad thing ever before in your life. I will tell you, for me, I have to keep going back to the cross with things that I'm reminded of that I have done that weren't so cool. I would prefer not to have that. If I had never done said things, guess what? I don't need to take those to the cross. The devil can never get me with that stuff because he's constantly, remember when you did that? Yeah, I know, I was a bad guy, blah, blah, blah. Next thing you know, you're licking your wounds until you realize that was the devil. Go take it to the cross. But you won't have to deal with that stuff. <clears throat> so we'll see under Neo, Nehemiah's leadership, the um, Jews, they're gonna withstand a lot of opposition and they came together to accomplish their goals of restoring a city, restoring um, a community. Uh, Nehemiah would not be lured from his responsibility as we'll see in Nehemiah 6.3 where it says, he said, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? So if you're doing a good work, just know that you're going to be bugged and keep on keeping on. Let the Lord lead, not to say if you're doing a good work and somebody says, hey, we need to talk about something, you might need to go talk to them because it, it's, it's critical. I know Neil, Neil had mentioned this somewhere that, that one of the things he was working on was, you know, there's a lot going on on Sunday and it's like, hmm, hmm. And he's working on, and I'm, I need to, you know, I'm saying this to myself, you know, my focus is to get things done. That's a good work, right? I got to do certain things on Sunday. But if somebody wants to talk to him and I blow them off, that's not a, necessarily a good thing either. So you just got to be careful. Where is this distraction, for lack of terms, coming from? Is it a distraction? Or is it something you definitely need to take care of? Because maybe that's a better work, for lack of terms. And so in chapter 3 um, of Nehemiah, uh, we can see and hopefully get an understanding of the criticisms which will come when you step out in service. Not all serving is going to be easy. What will you do when the, circumstance, when the serving um, becomes difficult because of some of the circumstances? Um, we'll see that he was able to overcome opposition from outsiders as well as internal turmoil. Often, and this is another thing that I was reading at the last. Um, a lot of the turmoil, criticism, critiques, um, the stronger slights, staff, will come from those supposedly doing the work with you, supposedly those that are in it with you. Um, and some of the things that are said that can kind of get you off seem benign because of, or, or frankly, even good, but they can get, they can get you off your path um, because you know if, if you're coming into church and you have somebody yelling at churches for suckers, right, you, you know that's op that opposition is garbage, right? You know, I'm going to church. I don't care what, what Bozo out front is saying as far as churches for suckers. So um, just, just know that. So he demonstrated a solid commitment to fulfill a pledge made to the Lord to rebuild Jerusalem. He knew what his task was, and he wanted to accomplish it. So he exhibited a steadfast determination to complete his goals. And according to those goals, or accomplishing those goals, uh, he knew it would result in a couple of things. People would be encouraged, 
people would be renewed, and people would be excited about their future, and more importantly, about their God. When you see good things happening, and you know where it's coming from, it could, it, it, it could ignite you, and it could excite you. So we see Nehemiah, he'll lead by example, giving up, again, as we, we talked about him being a cupbearer, giving up a respected position in the palace, um, and, and other than the fact that he had to be a guinea pig, I would say it was pretty cushy, right? Uh, probably, probably pretty cushy gig, um, of, other than the obvious of, of maybe being poisoned by something somebody's trying to give the king. Um, but he gave all that up for, for hard labor, which you know, was going to be the rebuilding of Jerusalem. So ne- Nehemiah's life, it's a demonstration of good leadership, and serving the Lord. He remained faithful, we'll see, to the Lord, even when um, opposed by an enemy or the circumstances. He was very humble before God. Um, chapters 1 and chapters 9 are already alluded to chapter 1, and when he heard of the sad news of what was going on in Jerusalem, verses 4 through 11, he, um, he stopped stopped what he was doing, and he was just weeping and praying for all those goings on, looking for the Lord to provide uh, a way. Ultimately, he would be part of that way of returning the people back to Jerusalem and rebuilding that city. We'll also see he doesn't claim glory for himself. He always gives your credit for his success to God. Then we'll see he wears a lot of hats. This goes back to earlier comments about just, you know, I think you know, all the different things he's been doing for the king um, and seeing done by the king um, has prepared him to do, to wear all the hats that he's going to have to wear uh, over, the, over time. Because as the king, he worked in government, um, so he served the king. He worked in government, he was a builder, and he was an ambassador, and yes, it's kind of alluded to before, he was a politician. He exercised his administrative skills and his strategy to use half the people, and this is just an example, for building while the other half kept watch for the Samaritans uh, <coughs> who threatened an attack because they didn't really care to see the, 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 the walls rebuilt. And that was in Nehemiah 4, verse 7. Um, so in his governor, Nehemiah negotiated peace among the Jews who were unhappy with Persian taxes. His life proved scripture. Uh, for he was entrusted with much when he initially uh, was faithful and little. Luke 19, 17, a verse in the parable of the ten talents, just one verse from it, and he said to him, well done, good servant, because you were faithful in very little, have authority over ten cities. Some would say he was very faithful being just the king's cupbearer, um, but when he goes to Jerusalem, he's governor. That's a pretty important position. I don't think God just woke up one day and said, I'm going to make you governor. He had seen Nehemiah demonstrate over time the ability to handle um, different things that he was given. Then again, Matthew 25, 21, parable of the talents, his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. So though Nehemiah, uh, through Nehemiah, we can gain an understanding about waiting on the Lord versus uh, acting on God's plan in God's way at his perfect time. We're waiting on the Lord to tell us, go. Um, You know, when Nehemiah, uh, when we start talking about chapter 1 next week, again, verse 4 through 11, he's praying, what should I do, what should I do? And if you look, probably between chapters one and chapters two, there's a couple two or three week period. So I think he was praying a lot over that period, not just, hey king, hey king, hey king, I gotta go to Jerusalem, it's a mess. Lord, we repent. Lord, forgive us for what we've done. My father, me, the Jews, what do you want us to do? What do you want me to do? And then at the end of verse 11, he said, I'm just a cupbearer, you know? So he's like, just a cupbearer, but I'm ready to do whatever. It's also a book um, and a demonstration of how God takes interest in the lives of his people. He answers prayer, and he's going to use Nehemiah as an instrument to impact his people. He wanted to bring them home. 
He was just waiting for the right time, the right person. And I shouldn't say he was waiting because the Lord knew when it was going to happen, but still, he was, he was waiting for things in our timing to, to come around such that he could use Nehemiah, right? Um, and God is not limited in what he can do or who he can use to fulfill his plans. Um, we'll kind of see, and not just here, but in other places, right? Um, empires, they rise, they fall, leaders change, leaders go, um, dynasties come and go. Um, but in Nehemiah specifically, we'll see how God used world rulers uh, for the purpose of sending Nehemiah back, giving him protection, giving him money, allowing him to do what Nehemiah wanted to do, which was re rebuild the city of Jerusalem. <clears throat> you may not see his hand, him being God, um, at all, at least until you are expectantly and in step with this plan looking. Um, and I was just, as I was reading this and thinking on, on this, you know, he was seeking the, the right time, the right place. Um, after the first week, and he's still praying, and Artaxerxes has not come to him, said, because I'm assuming he's still doing his job, right? Not saying, hey, God told me something. You're supposed to go to Jerusalem. It might have been he was sitting there saying, Lord, I've been praying for two days. Lord, I've been praying for three days. Lord, really? I've been praying for a week. Only a week? <laughs> but he's been praying for only a week, and he's you know, still not had an answer. Um, so God's working, and we may, not just, we may just not see it, right? He might have already been working on the king's heart already. Um, and that reminded me of kind of a, another story in 2 Kings 6, 14 through 17. I'm sure you guys have all heard this. You know, it's about Elijah's servant uh, and his inability to see God's hand, right? Verse 14, Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And the, his servant said to him, Alas, master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. So here we are in the same place, looking out the same window. One guy sees stuff, one guy doesn't see stuff. Why? Maybe Elisha, Elisha has been praying, Lord, protect us. Lord, show me your protection. Lord, and, and maybe the servant is not in tune. Or maybe God just didn't want to show him at the same time in the same way. Who knows, right? That, that's up to God. But net, net, um, the servant didn't see it. But yet, the hand of God was at work providing protection. He just didn't know it was there. And then, kind of one of the last things in, in this, and frankly, it's the story of, of the Bible, right? It's, it's the God's unfolding love and his ability to forgive us, because he's a very forgiving God. Um, we... You know, he had sent the Jews, as I said, to Babylon for a correctional timeout. Um, over and over, they're going to need to be corrected. They're going to blow it. God's going to take them back. Hmm, kind of reminds me of me. I blow it, come back, blow it, come back. Thankfully, God's always like, oh, you messed up? You for, you're forgiven if you ask. So that's, that's, that's a good thing. Um, and then, um, I'd like to say not too much like us, but, you know, Nehemiah goes back, they restore the city, um, rebuilding the walls, Nehemiah goes away, and shortly after he's gone, they're back to their, their ways. So Nehemiah comes back again about 12 years later, we'll find in Nehemiah 13.6, um, to find the people weak in their faith, and they're going to have to, he's going to have to, on some level, start over again, say, guys, what are you doing? What are you thinking? You got restored and you're still doing this garbage? Um, so, and this gets back to what I was saying earlier about some of the, some of the ways Nehemiah was trying to uh, draw uh, people back to the Lord, and I don't necessarily recommend this on the street. <clears throat> it says, and later in verse 25, we'll, we see him contending with them again, cursing them, striking them, even pulling their hair to get their attention back to the ways of God. So... I don't know that that works in today's society, but that's what he was up to, and it apparently worked for him. Um, whenever his people repent, 
through his loving kindness, he returns them to their land. So in this, these two verses um, came to me at the very end. I don't really know why other than um, talking about God being a forgiving God. Um, but John 3.17 says, For God did not sin. Uh, well, and I guess the other thing, forgiving God and the fact that we blow it, we can go get, we can go to God and ask, confess and ask for forgiveness, and he's not going to hold it against us. He's going to forgive us, and we're good to go. The enemy's going to be on our shoulder, you know, whining, you shouldn't have done that, are you really a Christian, all that kind of stuff, um, and try to condemn us. And that may be why this came into my head. But John 3, 17, sorry, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And then the second verse that came to me was Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So the context of 10, 9 is, is a salvation verse. Um, you know, we have a Nehemiah then coming to him saying, we're sorry, being restored to the, the, the city and a right relationship to God and all that kind of stuff. A little bit different context, but, but similar in nature where we make confession, he forgives, we're restored. Um, because if you're walking around, you've never said this prayer and you've not confessed, then you have no relationship. Um, how do you get that initial relationship? Romans 10.9. How do you get relationship restored over and over again? And hopefully it's not over and over and over and over and over, and over again for the same thing. Um, but how do you get that? You know, you repent and are reminded similar to what Nehemiah is doing with the people, reminding them of God's laws, God's ways, um, and leading them back into a relationship with Christ in, in that way.